Hi, everybody. Welcome, and thanks so much for joining us for this live discussion. Um, today, we have a special guest. Her name is Stephanie Williams, and she's 59 and from Texas. She was on clonazepam for four years. She did a very rapid taper, and it took her eight years to finally feel about 95% better. Let me introduce myself. My name is Nicole Lamberson. I trained as a physician assistant. I volunteer doing outreach for the film Medicating Normal, and I host conversations like the one that we're going to have today. So hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and tell your story for everybody. Hello. Thank you for having me here. Sure. So I guess to start out, we should probably give everyone some background about um, your history with psychiatric medications, um, if you were only on benzos or what exactly you took, and I guess when you were prescribed first and what what drug and why. Okay. Why? Okay. Um, in 2009, I was driving to work, which is an hour, uh, almost an hour drive there in, to there, and I was suffering from vertigo. Three months later, I go to the doctor and they can't figure out why I'm suffering from vertigo. They send me to a neurologist and he's told me that I've had a mild stroke. And at the time he didn't put me on medication, but I had to quit work. Well, the vertigo was just getting worse and worse. And I mean, the anxiety was just getting worse and worse and worse from the vertigo. Therefore, they send me to a regular doctor who sends me to a psychiatrist and I'm going through perimenopause. So my hormones are just whacked out. Mm -hmm. And the psychiatrist gives me Ativan at first for two weeks. I took it and it did nothing. He then gives me three milligrams of clonazepam to take. And I took one and within 30 minutes, my anxiety was gone. But he told me to take three milligrams and I was on the couch. I could not move. Um, long story short, uh, within two weeks, I could not drive. I, I could hardly get off the couch, but I did not want the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So he told me to just take one in the morning and one at night, which was one milligram of clonazepam in the morning and one milligram of clonazepam at night. And I did that for four years. Okay. So in hindsight, I guess, looking back, what do you think your issue really was? Just perimenopause or? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. My hormones, because I was waking up having adrenal rushes and that was giving me anxiety. Okay. And how old were you at the time? I was 45. Okay. Got mm -hmm. it. And so um, you just stayed on that same regimen of one milligram twice a day of clonopin for four years. Yes, ma'am. In that time period, um, did anything happen like is commonly reported in the withdrawal support groups like tolerance withdrawal or interdose withdrawal or adverse effects from the medication itself? Yes, ma'am. My anxiety was getting worse. The, the longer I took the medication, my anxiety was just getting worse to where it was starting to turn into panic. Cause it was helping like the first year, but like I say, it was just getting worse and worse. And then I was like, okay, do I take the three milligrams? But I didn't want to, because I knew that it was making me worse. Mm -hmm. so. so, so you were able to identify that the clonopin was the cause of your more severe anxiety at some point? Yes, ma'am. I guess about after two years, I could tell that after I took it, my anxiety and panic would start hitting. And then I knew, I was like, well, this is not doing what it's supposed to do or what it was doing in the first place. Okay. And so did you go back to your physician at all and report that you were having these issues or what did they say? Yes. And he told me that I was just going to have to, the psychiatrist told me that I would have to be on this medication the rest of my life. And I probably need to up my dose to make it stop doing that. Oh, stop okay. causing more anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing because the answer is usually the same from people every time I ask it, but I'll let you tell me if they gave you any informed consent at all when you were prescribed clonopin about 
that you could become physically dependent on it, that you could have a withdrawal syndrome, that tolerance could develop, any of those things? No, not at all. Not at all. Okay. So with your hormones though, you know, the perimenopausal stuff that you were having, um, how did you eventually sort of piece together that that was the problem? And then did you address them in any way with like, um, you know, HRT or anything like that? No, because I would go to different doctors who would try to hear me out, but all of them was just, they pretty much praise, you know, benzodiazepines as though I have a lot of patients that take this medication. So that cannot be what's causing that, you know, so every doctor that I went to never could, never would really help me. So I basically just kind of gave up on going and just kept taking my medicine like a good little patient. Yeah, this is so sad, but so common. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm 44 now. And mm -hmm. so I've started digging around some in the perimenopause uh, right. groups and looking around. And I see so many women in there who are just misdiagnosed as having mm -hmm. psychiatric conditions. And it's right, right at the phase of life where estrogen is tanking, mm -hmm. progesterone is tanking, they're having right. classic perimenopause symptoms yeah. and they're just parked on psychiatric drugs and sent home. And it's just, I mean, ridiculous. Half of, half of our population is gonna go through this change of hormones and we can't even identify it in people at the right age. It's just ridiculous. Right. Yeah. Right. And they turn it into a mental. I mean, why would you send me to a psychiatrist when it's my, obviously my hormones? Yeah. And yeah. nobody checked your levels or anything like that. No. Yeah. He told me that I should try tapping and I told him tapping is not helping this kind of anxiety. Yeah. So. Okay. So let's sort of fast forward. You're starting to have these adverse effects on benzos. They're making you more anxious. Your original condition, which is the hormonal imbalance is not being fixed. Right. Um, when you were going back, were they offering you like, well, your anxiety is worsening. And so now let's try an antidepressant or let's try, were, were they offering you more psychiatric drugs? They, uh, maybe one of them did, but usually I just tried to stay away from the doctor. I was just so sick from going through interdose withdrawal that I didn't, I just didn't go to the doctor. As long as I could find a doctor that kept giving me refills, that's the only time I went to a doctor. Okay. Well, probably smart because lots of people fall into that trap. They get mm -hmm. on three, four, six drugs because mm -hmm. the benzo started causing problems, you know, that was misdiagnosed as some other worsening right. psychiatric illness. Right. So at what point then do you decide, okay, I don't want to be on this clonopin anymore. And, and why, why did you finally come to that place? I was in a new relationship um, because obviously I lost my husband, my, my house, everything because I was just a couch potato and I was in a new relationship. And if I drank one or two beers, it was like I drank a 12 pack. And I said, something is going on. What is going on? So I get on Facebook and I never looked up benzodiazepine. I never even looked up that word. I looked up clonazepam. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there was a group in there. And then I was learning, oh, this is what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. And then I seen all these groups and I was like, and that's where I learned that uh, you can taper off of them. And what else did I find? Oh, Benzo Buddies. There was somebody on there trying to help me with a taper. Yeah. But before I found all this out, I was cutting one of my milligrams in half for like three weeks. And I was just in panic mode. It was like a cold turkey. I couldn't sit still. Mm -hmm. And then I started tapering at one and a half milligrams. Okay. So you didn't add the half milligram back. You just no. started. Yeah. No, ma'am. I didn't. It didn't click that I should do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For so many people, we just show up here and, and we're in a horrible state already mm -hmm. because we we made some kind of mistake with right. trying to reduce. The doctors typically don't know how to tell you how to come off. And so you're sort of just on your own becoming an internet sleuth, you know, trying to figure yes. out how to help yourself. Mm -hmm. I want to back up just a minute though, because you mentioned something. You were so ill from the clonopin that your marriage 
completely fell apart and you lost your job. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I lost my job. And then going through all these doctor visits, they diagnosed me with the stroke. Then they diagnosed me with having um, oxygenism, not oxygenism. What do you call it? The with your eyes oh, nystagmus. Oh, glaucoma. Oh, glaucoma. Okay. Glaucoma. And mm -hmm. then I yeah, I lost my husband because he didn't understand what was going on. I lost my house, you know, and I was so sick. I just didn't want to fight or argue or nothing. I just left. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. Lost everything. Yeah. So now you're on one and a half milligrams and you found all this information online. And what did the rest of your, your taper plan look like? I was trying to do it by dry cutting but that just wasn't working. Every time I would cut just a tiny bit, it was like I was taking off like a half a milligram or something. That's how intense it was. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't being told to hold as long as I needed. It was just take off this much every day. And I don't remember who was helping me, but I probably wouldn't say their name anyway. Yeah. Um, but then I went to uh, water tapering. What is the word for it? Oh, titration titration I went to that and I did that for like almost a year but the damage was done cutting that half a milligram it was like almost a cold turkey yeah so you just never stabilized again no, and stayed no. in terrible state of withdrawal basically yeah. and how long did it take you to get off the last one and a half milligrams then um I did 14 months okay 14 months and do you want to explain for everybody what kind of symptoms you were having as you were, you know, after that half milligram cut, you know, throughout your taper. And then once you were off, you know, I was, yes, ma'am. I was very suicidal the whole time. Mm -hmm. uh, I could not stop crying the whole time. I had so many symptoms. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I just, I was too sick to get back on Facebook to see what everybody was going through and but symptom wise, yeah, the worst one is just so I cried and cried and cried and cried. Mm -hmm. um, I still have memory issues to this day. So trying to think about all that right now. Yeah. Um, I ended up leaving that relationship too, because I just, I was no good for nobody. I wasn't even good for myself, much less somebody else, you know? Yeah. And you were unable to work the entire time. Basically. Oh, not at all. Not yeah. at all. What What was your day like during that, that time? Can you sort of paint a picture for us what you did all day? I, with, I paced a lot. Like the first six months I paced and just paced and cried. And of course, uh, I had my, what I call benzo mask on where people didn't see how I really felt and what was going on, you know? Um, but it was, I was just miserable for like six months. I couldn't stop crying. And I did stay on Facebook a lot because I did join a few of the groups and I ended up adminning and helping that kept me distracted. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I had all the symptoms you can think of except seizures. I'd never had a seizure. Yeah. What about your ability to leave the house? Like, did you, were you able to go anywhere or grocery I, shop for yourself? Any of that? I could drive maybe four blocks. If it was any further than that, then I didn't drive mm -hmm. because I was so dizzy. And I didn't start driving until like two years ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I could go to the store like two blocks away and get sandwiches because that's about all I could do was make a sandwich. I couldn't yeah. cook or anything. Yeah. And so did you have any support mm -hmm. during this time? Did you have family or friends or anybody in person my son and daughter they tried to but they didn't understand it you know they thought mom was just depressed you know from losing her house and her family and all her husband and all that but they didn't they get it now but at the time they didn't understand but no I didn't really have any support yeah and you tried I guess explaining and it, it just wasn't something they could at the time sort of wrap their heads around it. No, I would print, print out literature and have, try to get them to read it. But everybody's so busy with their life, they don't have time to try to understand it. Yeah. 
It's funny you say that they understand now. I've heard that so many times uh-huh. from my withdrawal friends who get better. Uh-huh. It's almost like you have to get better in front of their own eyes for them to see. And then, right. be like, oh, like she was telling the truth the whole right. time. And right. then once you're better, they sort of get on board and understand what happened to you, mm-hmm. which is so upsetting because the when you need people on board and to understand what's happening to you is when it's happening, not when you're better, you know? Right. Right. Well, they see the difference in you too. Cause you know, you put your makeup on every day, but when you're sick like that, you don't, you barely can brush your hair, you can barely brush your teeth or put your makeup on and they see that difference. They're like, Oh, she's okay now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So were were you like me then just, you know, matted hair and not getting out of your pajamas and not brushing your teeth and not taking a shower for days and. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I would joke, I would joke on Facebook and say, Hey, I took a shower, you know, it was only three weeks, but I took a shower and everybody kind of, we all giggled and laughed about it because they knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. I would say like, it feels like I'm trying to just to function, do the basics, exactly. like walk through quicksand uphill with a lead suit on or something like that's how difficult yes. the daily grind of just things that other people who are healthy just do every day, like get out of bed and brush your teeth and take a bath and put on clothes, you yes. know? I always said I felt like a turtle in peanut butter just trying to walk on, you know, across the room. Yeah. That was my little saying all the time. That's a good I like yours better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> What's yours? Oh, the quick oh, the metal. Yeah, yeah, uphill in a in a with a lead suit all on. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Um, you you don't really have much family support. I mean, there, there are a couple people who are there for you, but don't really understand. Right. What about um, the groups, you know, the online groups? Did you make friends? Did you find them helpful on your journey? Yes. That's where most of my support was is Facebook. And that's pretty much where I lived in my apartment while not being showered for three weeks and eating sandwiches every day it was on Facebook because they understood me you know, and I understood them. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. That's what I pretty much did for, and in this apartment, I've been here seven years and it was like five years of that. Yeah. And on my table, I even had a, an indention on my wood table from where I sit there on that computer constantly like this. Yeah. Just I had to like hold my head up. Just your trying to only hold my head. connection to the world, your socialization, all of it was just these strangers online, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. You don't have to answer this if it's too invasive. Just tell me. Uh, but financially, did you just go off of savings? Did you have disability? How did you survive? As soon as I lost my job and I went to the neurologist and had the stroke, that I was approved for disability within three months. So I can say I was one of the lucky ones, but disability doesn't pay near as much as your job does, you know? Yeah. So it was yeah. scraping by, I'm sure, but lucky yes, to ma'am. have it anyways. Yes, ma'am. So just with the stroke, did you actually have a stroke or the benzo stuff was being misdiagnosed as stroke? No, I actually had had a stroke and that's what caused my vertigo. Uh-huh. And I still to this day have vertigo. So that's another reason my disability was approved mm-hmm. is because my vertigo is so severe. I'll never be able to lay back again. I have yeah. to lay up. Okay. So what was the overlap like, I guess, because somebody watching this is going to be like, oh, psh, see, she didn't have any benzo withdrawal. She had a stroke and she's blaming it on the pills or whatever. So I'm just wondering like the timeline of the stroke and the benzo stuff. Okay, well, the stroke, okay, what's the question again? Uh, when, I guess, when did you have the stroke? And then when did the, the benzo withdrawal stuff manifest? Okay, well, I had the stroke. I'm, I had the vertigo in 2009. So I'm going to say I had the stroke in 2009, okay. is, which is when I lost my job. And then the, uh, the anxiety was getting worse two years after starting the clonazepam. But the symptoms of coming off of that's when four four years later of being off, 
are starting to uh, taper, that's when all the symptoms hit me. So it had nothing to do with my stroke at all. Okay. Because I could function, I could function, I could drive, I could live life and laugh. Yeah. So that's what you would say essentially to the naysayer who said, well, how do you know it's the drugs that caused you problems? Well, like a doctor told me, how do you know that the uh, stroke and the the uh, vertigo is not causing your anxiety? Because I could still drive, I could still eat, I could still go out with my friends. I didn't cry 24-7. I didn't want to end my life 24-7. That's how I know. Yeah, and it all coincided with you making changes in the medication. Yes, yeah. yes ma'am. Okay, gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Um, and so... Uh, I guess then you're just sitting at home and you've got these indentations in your table from being on the the computer so much, just having support and going through the the motions of the days of suffering. Um, I guess tell us then um, over the next how many years were you like that and what was the progression of things like? Um, was it just slowly improving uh did you have severe symptoms for a long long period of time and then all of a sudden you started feeling better how did things go for you um out of all of the the uh, symptoms I wish to this day that I would have kept a journal and if there's anybody just starting with this please keep a journal um because I it's hard for me to remember when certain symptoms went away but they did trickle away you know because this one will go away, but this one's so bad that you forget that one went away, mm-hmm. you know, but I guess the lingering was uh, sleeping issues. I still to this day have real bad sleeping issues. I can't sleep hard at, at, at night. And then the memory issues I have and anxiety is a lot better unless any kind of drama or something like that. My central nervous system is still pretty fragile, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm going to say most of the symptoms I had, oh, and feeling super heavy and fatigue. Um, I've had those up until I started working last year. Mm-hmm. Um, what else was really about anxiety? Yeah, but they just, they trickled away. And like I say, I couldn't remember which ones went away, but I always had those five with me until the end, mm-hmm. until a year ago. Did you have um, the typical windows and waves that people describe? Like you would have great days and then it would come back and then lift or was it more just like a slow progression? I never had the windows to where everybody said they feel normal. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I can say that the stroke also has messed that up too, but I felt fine before the stroke. So I'm going to say that didn't have anything to do with that, but the waves for five years, I would get hit with a wave at least once a month and it would put me back on the couch for a week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I got a lot of waves. Yeah. So what, what was the timeline then you're off of Clonopin and then when did you go back to work? How long did that take? Okay. I was off of Clonopin in 2014 and I just started work in 2022 of last year. So 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, eight years. Yeah. And as far as going back to work, um, I guess, was it just like, for me in my withdrawal syndrome or whatever, I always think like, before I got sick from benzos, I didn't have to like, think hard about, you know, am I ready to do something? Am I, I would just do it. Cause I felt like a normal person, you know? Right. But now when you're sick like this, you sort of overanalyze everything and think like, well, could I, or am I, or, so I guess I want to know, like, how did you know that you were ready to work or did it feel natural? Like it did before you got sick, like you were just, I can work, you know? Right. Well, I, to be honest, I still do that. And then COVID hit and then, you know, your central nervous system is like, no, not COVID too. So I was just scared of the world again. Yeah. And um, I guess last year, March of last year, I was done. I was done. I couldn't live like this no more. Mm-hmm. And I have a friend that works at or runs a thrift store here and it's a nonprofit organization, feeds the community, 
you know, that has a pantry. And uh, I reached out to her and she said, Steph, come up here, let's talk. Mm-hmm. So I went up there and, you know, boohooed my eyes out and told her what was going on. She said, well, why don't you come in volunteer a couple of days a week? So that turned out to be 40 hours a week, just so I wasn't at home thinking about what I was going through. Mm-hmm. And then um, four months later, I got on part time because I don't want to lose my disability because sometimes my vertigo will hit me and I'll be down for a week or two. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to lose that. But do you think some, I mean, you, you obviously had to be at a place where you were healed enough to do that, right? Because five years um, prior, would you have been able to volunteer the amount of time that you're doing or? Yeah. No, but I also told myself I wasn't ready then to, you're so used to kicking your own butt because you feel like everybody's judging you and thinking that you're weird all of a sudden. What happened to her, you know? Yeah. Did she have a mental breakdown? What happened to her? So you think every, and when I went in there the first time, I felt like everybody was staring at me. Mm -hmm. If you go in the store, you feel like everybody's staring at you. They're really not, but you're just so down and out. You feel that way. Yeah. It's probably weird. I imagine like maybe how people who get out of prison feel when they come back Mm -hmm. into the world. Like, did you feel sort of like that? Like everything was just new and like you hadn't been out and functioning in so long did it oh, feel oh yeah I mean I was asking my friends at the store you know I was like so what kind of shirts are they wearing now it was just like that Nicole mm-hmm. what kind of shirts are popular right now you know mm-hmm. what kind of dresses are in right now and I know they kind of look at you like huh you yeah know, but because it's impossible to explain right like how do you tell anybody oh I was just on an eight year hiatus from life in my apartment. And I, I wasn't, and, yeah. yeah. And I do there, you know, there comes a point where you're like, Oh, I'm so tired of telling people this story, but I'll never stop being tired of telling this story. Yeah. You know, it almost got me. So I'm, I'm happy now Yeah, that I made it. Yeah. And so I guess that's something I want to hear about too, is you say, you're happy that you made it, but like emotionally, you know, you were crying and you had all of these neuro emotions, I guess, false emotions generated Mm -hmm. by your nervous system being broken. Do you Mm -hmm. feel pretty emotionally stable now? Like you, your feelings are your own and you're happy and you can feel joy and all of those kinds of things. Yes. That is slowly, but surely coming back. Uh, when I first started, I didn't feel the joy. I was just like a robot. But now that I'm back to myself, I love to tease people. That's just me. I'm back to teasing people, mm-hmm. you know, laughing, whatever they need. Some people come in the store and they're down and out and I love helping them. And yeah, I'm starting to get my joy back. Yeah. You know, laughing and I'm not crying and boohooing every day. So yeah. yeah, I just, it gets better. It gets better. Yeah. And your family members, I guess they've probably noticed a huge difference in you. Do they comment or say anything? Oh yeah. And they, it's even funny with us because I went to one of my brothers Sunday and I told him I drove all the way to Plano, which is an hour away from me. Mm-hmm. And they said, Oh, my baby girl is growing up, you know, but that's just the way we tease each other. But when I see them, they always tell me they're proud of me because I didn't give up. Yeah. You no, know, so. Yeah. Well, I'm proud of you too, Stephanie. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I want to know if you have any tips, I guess, for people, oh, just at the beginning or in the thick of it, uh, somebody who's having, you know, a really hard time, like what kind of coping mechanisms did you use? Or people always ask me, like, how did you, how did you suffer for so long? And it's such a hard question to answer. Uh, what would you say? Uh, um, I think, well, like my brothers have told me, she's too hard headed not to keep fighting, you know, and that is me. I'm very hard headed. Yeah. And I, I always said from the beginning, I'm not going to let a pill beat me. A pill is not, I only get one life and you're not taking my life. Mm-hmm. You know, it tried, but, um, my, I guess my number one, um, thing would be is don't give up distract 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 if it's coloring if all you can do is a puzzle if all you can do is play with your dog your cat whatever just something to stay out of your head 
-hmm. you know, and remind yourself every minute of the day that it's going to get better. Yeah. What about some of the more, you know, woo woo things? You know, I always feel so granola, I guess, when I talk about like, I did breathing and I took baths and went for walks and listened to guided meditations. Did any of those sorts of things help you at all? No, you know, and I don't want to tell people, ah, oh, that don't work because, you know, we're all genetically different too. Mm-hmm. You know, what might help one person might not help the other. I couldn't do the tapping. You know, I was get so mad, I'd be, you know, <laughs> tapping. <laughs> Or, you yeah, know, I, I didn't get into the tapping. I just uh, felt like, oh, it actually kind of hurt. I was like, this hurts. Uh, but I know people who say they really, the tapping helps. Right. So, yeah. Right. You know, and that's what I say. I don't want to say, you know, nah, I ain't going to help you because different things help different people. Mm-hmm. My main thing was I played a lot of games, uh, the seek and find on my computer. Mm-hmm. I spent hundreds of dollars on the little CDs at Walmart that you put in there and you, I was constantly trying to keep my brain busy Mm -hmm. where you look for the rabbit or the whatever in there. I just, whatever I could do. Yeah. Same distraction was huge and still is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a selfish question that I'm going to ask because I want to know, did you have um, the depersonalization and derealization symptom? Oh, really bad, but it was hard to decipher because of my vertigo. Mm because vertigos will make your eyes, you know, do weird things too. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, when I, for the first time I would walk into a store, it was just like oh, overwhelming. Mm-hmm. I had that really bad up until two years ago. And can you explain for me, I guess, like how it went away? Did you just start to like, sort of feel it fade or how did mm-hmm. like, Cause for me, I feel like I'm just sort of disconnected from the world. Like I'm trapped inside of myself and I can't really connect yeah. to the world. And yeah. I'm just wondering, like, you know, did you start just feeling like you were connecting once in a while and then all of a sudden, or how did it sort of go for you? It, every once in a while I felt that way, but again, I pushed myself to go to that store mm-hmm. and start volunteering because I felt that way every day too. I felt like I was just in this box mm-hmm. constantly or bubble. Yeah. You know, and I just couldn't get out of that bubble. And that was just getting me more and more sad, more and more sad. So I just had to push myself and get out there. And if I got COVID, I got COVID. I had got COVID in 2020 and it hurt me bad. Yeah. But I was like, it's either stop it myself or go live. Yeah. So I went ahead and pushed through it. And don't get me wrong, Nicole. I still have the vision problems mm-hmm. driving. I still have blurry vision. But you feel connected to your surroundings and people. I, around yes, you I world. do now. I do now. Now that I've got out and started getting back to myself, I do. Mm-hmm. But I feel I noticed also if the blurriness starts coming back, it's when I have I get a little bit of anxiety or nervous. Yeah. Okay. Nervous. Sort of like what is this or what's going to happen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe on that, I guess, do you feel, you know, traumatized by this experience in any way? Because I hear people all the time scared, you know, they're in the thick of it, which is the worst time to be projecting into the future about how things are going to be but they're worried they're going to be traumatized forever. They're going to have PTSD. They're, you know, going to be afraid of, of going to the doctor forever. What would you say is your experience with that? I thought I was going to be that way. And I also thought I was going to be angry at doctors for the rest of my life, but that's all gone now. It, that'll leave you too, you know, because once again, you're sitting there and you're, you're constantly feeling bad. So you're constantly thinking about all this. But once you get out there and you start distracting and you start feeling better, that'll, that'll go away. Yeah. It went away for me. Okay. And I just want to ask about your saying, like, you know, you pushed yourself. Um, Sometimes I see that in the groups and it, it irritates me because I think like we're all at different phases. Right. And so somebody might be like, you have to push yourself. But if you're in like the beginning, you know, six years of 
terrible sickness like you and I, where we weren't getting off the couch and somebody's telling you to push yourself. Sometimes I feel like that's just sort of counterproductive. Like that's going to just make the person worse. They're going to be too ill. Right. Um, but when you say push yourself, do you feel like it was just like a time and a place and you were then you're at a point where you're able to sort of push yourself? And oh, like- absolutely. Cause I'm yeah. like you, people say, you just need to push yourself really come help me get off this couch and I'd be happy to push myself Mm -hmm. I was like you had it would make me very angry but when I say that I mean personally I was like it's either Stephanie Mm -hmm. you're going to end your life or are you going to push yourself yeah so I reached out that was the hardest part for me is reaching out and I reached out and yeah. yeah and I still to this day push myself yeah I get home and I feel those chain ball and chains on my legs you know Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so so things are still kind of difficult. You're still coexisting with symptoms, but you yes. describe yourself as being 95% healed. Yes. Um, you know, how bad of a struggle is that 5%? Um, I would say it's getting better. Um, the fear was the number one, the fear. Mm-hmm. And that's getting better because I was just scared of everything in my shadow. And still somebody will come around a corner and I'd jump, you know, like crazy and they're like are you okay I'm like yeah you know Mm -hmm. but I would say everything that like the lack of sleep the anxiety the muscle pain just the constant muscle pain that's all getting better it's all getting better yeah I have a friend who's doing way better I mean he's you know very healed but he's Mm -hmm. still you know has a little maybe a little tiny ways to go and he says that even though like you describe, you still jolt easy mm-hmm, or, mm-hmm. you know, the nervous system is just still sensitive, but he feels like he bounces back faster. It doesn't take him down like it used to. Do you that's, feel like, yes, yeah, that's the way I feel before it would just be like, you know, just, oh my gosh. And then put me in a panic or to now it's like, ah, oh, stop doing that. Yeah. You know, you're okay. You can, you can so, deal with it better. I and can it's, deal with it better. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and then yeah. I guess I want to ask, do you have hope that the last 5% will go? And if it doesn't, is that okay? Can you live like this? Yes, I have a lot of hope. And because I can feel it getting better all the time, mm-hmm. um, I think I can live like this. I can live compared to what, it would, you know, the way we have lived, mm-hmm. I can live with this. Yeah. And I found it hard to tell people that I was protracted when they reached out to me. Did you ever feel that? Because you didn't want to scare them. But I thought, you know, it's not fair to us not to mention that we're protracted for years, you know, because people need to know that too. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's protracted people that need help, you know, at at your timeline, when you were five years off, if Mm -hmm. you hadn't heard from somebody at eight saying Mm -hmm. that they got better, you might lose hope you know, exactly. so exactly. everybody has to have space in this, right. tell their stories. And yeah, I'm sorry that people get scared of the longer timelines, but you know, we have to let people tell those because there's people who have long timelines that need to right. know they can improve, you know, right. and I agree. you know, for anybody listening, just disclaimer, if you're early on in this, one of the biggest mistakes I think people make is just comparing yourself. You know, you can put so much energy into worrying that you're going to be eight years like Stephanie that you just saw on Facebook telling her story. And a lot of times it doesn't materialize. There's people who recover in 12 months, you know, six months. It's just, nobody can tell you what you're, what you're going to be. And so you kind of just have to accept that we're all on our own journey yes. and you know, don't, don't compare so much to other people, but we can listen to Stephanie's story and have hope that hell, even if it goes on eight years, like she's telling us that it got better. So it does. I promise you it gets better. Everybody that I know gets better. Mm -hmm. I also know Stephanie, um, Baylissa Frederick for people listening who don't know who she is. She's a a withdrawal coach who went through mm-hmm. withdrawal herself. And she's been around for, I would say almost probably 20 years at this point um, in the withdrawal communities. 
And she said that even when she felt like she was healed, later she realized she was still healing. So, yeah. you know, maybe your last 5% or whatever, that's sort of the same, you know, you right. think you're there, but then all of a sudden you're the next year, maybe you're 99 and you're like, oh, I thought I was, but this is even better, you know? Right. You'll have to come back and tell us. We'll check in with you uh, with more time and see, you know, did the 5% go and how are you feeling maybe a year from now? I would love that because I always tell everybody don't give up because, you know, you're still writing your book and this isn't the end of your book and everybody's going to have a happy ending eventually. When you were in the thick of it, when it was most severe, I mean, if you would have given up at that time, did you have any indication that healing was coming or you would have just given up and it would have been too soon? I just, at that time and point, I didn't care. I was just so miserable. I didn't think about, I think I was so disheartening at the 18 month timeline that they put there, you know, and I mm. kind of, I don't like that. But uh, once I did the 18 month and then the two years then the three years, the four years, mm the landmarks, right? Yes. I always say it's like, I, I I see what you're saying. I hate when people do that too. And say like, mm-hmm. maybe by 18 months, you'll be recovered. And so you hang mm-hmm. on to that so tightly. Mm-hmm. So disheartening. Yeah. But at the same time, if we don't sort of dangle the carrot or like make it into manageable chunks for people, I'm not yes. sure that they could go if they didn't, if they had to look and see, it might take years and years and years, you know what I mean? Like maybe the, the hope for these 18 months, two years, whatever sort of just keeps them like clawing, you know? Oh, it did me for sure. You know? And I was like, okay, well, I've done two years. I'm miserable. Okay. I've done three years. I'm miserable, but I was also ever a cheerleader too, because I want to see everybody else heal too. And that always made me feel so much better because yeah. I knew I was going to get there. I just didn't know when. Yeah. You know? I know. So, this may be an exercise in insanity, sort of looking back and whatever. I mean, but I guess I always, I always ask people if you had to do it over again, what, what would you have done differently that you think maybe would have given you a better outcome or made things easier? I would have took that half a milligram and and started back at the original two milligrams instead mm-hmm. of just holding off to see if I could get some kind of stability mm-hmm. and then did a, a very slow taper because mm-hmm. my CNS could not handle that big cut. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Yes. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any questions, I guess, if people have any questions for Stephanie and you're watching, go ahead and feel free to ask and I'll pass them along. Um, We always hear from people, Stephanie, who are doing better, who say, you know, I'm grateful for the experience because it turned me into a new person or I've learned so many lessons from having gone through this. Do you feel that way at all? Do you, what, what have you learned? Um, all of that. I've learned that I can put a, I can uh, deal with a lot. (laughs) Anybody that can go through this can, can uh, deal with a lot. It's made me more grateful. It's made me slow down in life. You know, don't take life so seriously. Um, Love more, you know, just, yeah. Just love more, but most of all, love yourself, Mm -hmm. take care of yourself. And what about, I always feel kind of bad about this, but I don't know if, if in your experience being in the groups, you, you use the same terminology as me, but we call the people who haven't been through withdrawal, like normals or the Mm -hmm. normies, you know, Yes. are you ever annoyed at them now that they are, you know, they care about stupid stuff or they get worked up over things that maybe because we've been through something so horrific that that's just like who cares you know do you feel that way now that you're back in society at all yes I'm like yeah if you even knew if you even knew 
Um, for instance, there's a gentleman that comes in our store. He was homeless for like six months and he's in an apartment now and he'll come in and he complains. And I'm like, be grateful. You have a roof over your head, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, but constantly I'm thinking that, you know, have you been through anything for eight years to where you just wanted to die every day? You know, I have thoughts like that, that I, you know, I shouldn't think that way. I know, but yeah, but it's, it's hard. Not, not to. It's hard not to, when you've been through something, this is the hardest thing I've ever went through ever. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah. on that same note, then, do you feel disconnected from other people who haven't been through this or it, it's I not, mean, I, I still, I still feel sorry for them, for their, you know, their pains and everything that they're going through, of course, you know, and I wouldn't wish this on anybody, mm -hmm. anybody, you know, but yeah, now that I'm feeling better, I, I'm, I'm starting to, you know, feel sad for them or whatever you know but before I'd be like whatever yeah. your problems are nothing you yeah. don't even know what you're talking about yeah. I wish I could have that problem you know mm -hmm. so. so some of that sort of I don't know I don't want to call it like bitterness but like you oh know. I was bitter yeah I was very bitter <laughs> yeah some of that is fading and you're able to now to sort of reintegrate into society and you're not you know, do you think about benzo withdrawal very much during your day or not? Really? Um, yeah, because I really don't have a choice, you know, like when I fumble on words and I'm like trying to remember words, but you can't, this is something that I, I can't stop thinking about, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm still not 100%. Yeah. But, uh, and it's still new, you know, eight years compared to one year of being, you know, feeling better. It's still new to me. Yeah trying to and learn how to live life again. What about, um, you know, you mentioned COVID. I know a lot of people, once they get healing, they are terrified to get sick with something or take a medication or whatever, you know, this crippling fear of a setback. Right. Do you, do you live in that place of fear? I, had, or? I did. I did up until I started feeling better this year. I would, you know, I would take an aspirin or Tylenol or something like that. I stayed away from most of the vitamins, but mm -hmm. I did have to take vitamin D. Uh, fortunately, it did not rev me up like it did some people, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not in that fear no more. No, ma'am. Yeah. But you're just maybe cautious, would you say, about... I was the first time I got the COVID, I got the severe case, you know, but the hospital was full and could not save or could not put me in there or I'm sorry, hold on. That's okay. And uh, the second time I got, it was just like a cold. So now I don't have that fear. Yeah. Know, but, but I mean, like beyond COVID, I mean, if you ever needed to take an antibiotic or whatever, are you worried at all? Or are you just sort mm. of? I kind of, yeah, mm -hmm. still, I mean, I, I can take an antibiotic and it's so far I'm good, but you can just never in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, oh, please don't set me back. Please don't set me back. Yeah. You know, cause that's a long time to go yeah. through to have to have a setback. Yeah. Even exactly. having a beer, I'm scared to even drink because I don't want to have a setback. Yeah. It's I think that's not worth probably. It smart for now anyways until the nervous system you know yeah. heals more and gets more resilient so yes yeah yep it's not worth it to me yeah all right well I guess we're about at time um, okay if there's anything else I want to give you a chance to share any like closing thoughts with people if you have any um you know burning things that you want to get off your chest before we close please do so I, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And finally, I get to be on here. You know, I've, I've listened to y'all and watched you all for years. Um, I just want to tell everybody, which I've always told you, please keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, it gets better. And all y'all seen how bad I suffered. Yeah. I never told anybody that I didn't want to be here because I'm going to be your cheerleader. I'll always be your cheerleader. And um, yeah, just keep going. Please keep mm -hmm. going. Okay. It gets better. What about activism, Stephanie? Are you involved? Do you do you want to keep doing things to spread the word? Oh, I do. I still get messages this, to this day, and I try to answer them as much as I can, even though I'm working part time. But yeah, I still 
there's people that aren't on Facebook that I talk to, you know, but of course I send them to you or somebody that's on the internet that they can watch or on YouTube. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I talk to, I talk to people all the time. Mm -hmm. And what about your benzo friends? Um, Do you think you'll be lifelong friends? Are these people that you're keeping in your life or? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And all y'all, you know, or y'all, y'all are my cheerleaders, you know, so I'll always be friends with y'all. Yeah. Couldn't have done it without, without any of y'all. Yeah. Crazy, right? The hardest thing you've ever been through and some strangers online saved your life. I will always be grateful. Always be grateful for all of the hard work that y'all do. All of you. I'm so grateful for y'all. Well, thanks for coming on and sharing your story. I I know it's going to give hope to a lot of people and hopefully people will see it and just, you know, hang in there and keep going and hopes for their own healing and uh, recovery story. Yeah. Yes. It will get better. Yeah. All right. So thanks everybody for joining us for this discussion. If you haven't seen the film Medicating Normal yet, you can check out our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch for the many ways you can view it. There's more interviews like this one coming up. You can find them on our Facebook page under the events tab. And lastly, if you'd like to support the film's outreach efforts with a donation, you can do so at medicatingnormal.com slash donate. Thanks again, Stephanie. Big hugs to you. And thank you, um, Nicole. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll Bye, talk everybody. Soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.